Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of This Old Garden. This week we start our animal edition where we'll be talking about animals in addition to plants. Now we're not gonna be starting with this sort of animal. We're not talking about mammals today. We are instead going to start with birds and insects as we talk about pollinators. So let's head over to the pansies and get started. Here we are over at the pansies and you'll notice that they are nice and bright and wide open at this point. Uh, also that purple one right in the middle of the frame there just had a pollinator visit and that's going to be the focus this week. These bright flowers are going to attract insects and hummingbirds so that they can exchange pollen with each other and create a situation that is more favorable for generating seeds in the future. So what happens is the pollinators come along and as they are drinking from one flower, they pick up pollen and then they move to another flower and they deposit pollen and pick up more pollen and they do what's called cross pollination. And that means that there is pollen from multiple flowers being deposited and exchanged and that's what helps flowers make better seeds. Came over to check on the blueberries and as it turns out, we have ourselves a friendly little pollinator visiting to get in on the last of the blooms here before they start to fall off. And we're just down to the formation of the berries. Oh, we have a second pollinator in here. Got a couple nice little bees here spreading the pollen between the blossoms. It's nice of them to help me out. And as you can see, more and more of the blossoms are falling off and over here we have many more that are already in the process of forming into berries and in just a few weeks we will have something to eat a couple weeks ago we took a look at the dianthus here and it wasn't much uh just a, a little bit of a shrubby looking brownish patch with some green stems coming out of it a little bit of leaves uh, but now it's really opening up nicely we have bright blooms and pretty soon we're gonna see pollinators all over the place coming after these flowers because like we said before bright colors mean lots of pollinator attraction here we have a plant that we haven't looked at yet, and this is bee balm. Now it doesn't look terribly colorful right now, but pretty soon it's going to start putting out really, really bright flowers. And just like its name suggests, it attracts pollinators like crazy, especially bees. They'll be all over this here in, in my front garden in just a couple weeks as these flowers get really cranking. So we'll be checking back in on these and hopefully be able to see some pollinators going crazy over the bright flowers pretty soon. Here you can see a wasp that landed on the awning on my deck. Uh, now a lot of people think that wasps are not very helpful or that they are just bothersome pests that come after you and, and attack and try to sting, but actually they're really great at deterring pests from being in your garden. They eat harmful insects and they're actually pollinators like bees. So it's actually kind of good to keep them around if it's not a safety hazard for you and your family. Here's another pollinator that a lot of times gets overlooked and that is the hummingbird. Now here we see it at a feeder and that is going to be human provided, but hummingbirds also love brightly colored flowers and will flit around your garden, uh, starting right about this time of year and continuing on throughout the summer. As you look at the picture that's now up on the screen, you can see that hummingbirds are also attracted to flowers, not just feeders that people put out, which makes them excellent pollinators as they go from flower to flower, picking up some pollen as they go and dropping it off at the next bloom that they stop at. Birds. Let's, Let's get, get some, some facts. Birds are a really large group of animals, and it's comprised of many different species with a lot of really cool adaptations. Where you'll find the most difference between different types of birds is in their types of beaks and feet. All birds have similar structures in that they do have beaks and feet, but if you look at the different types on the diagram here, you can see that different beaks are used for filtering or probing, catching insects, 
for cracking seeds. Uh, some beaks are designed for uh, attacking other animals, such as we see with birds of prey. And then there's the types of feet. Some are adapted for swimming or perching or, again, catching other animals. So that's where you're going to see the greatest variety in the different types of birds outside of the different colors that we see. Speaking of feet, it's important to note that all birds have two feet. There are no four-footed birds anywhere in the world. Just like us, birds are warm-blooded. That means that their temperature stays the same. So birds and mammals have that in common. If you take a look at the picture of the tree here, you can see all sorts of holes and notches carved in a stump. And these were all created by a single woodpecker pecking away at the stump to get the insects that are living inside. It's amazing that one bird can do all this by itself. Before we get into facts about more specific birds, I wanted to take an opportunity to look at this video that I grabbed from the underside of my deck. You can see a bird just flew into frame there. And this guy has a nest up under the deck that you can see here. I, I've circled it. And then uh, we've got the second bird coming in there. They are a mated pair and they have a nest together under there. And this is a great example of birds adapting to human construction. When humans build things, they frequently take down trees and shrubs and things, and it takes away some bird habitat, and they adapt to live in conjunction with the new construction that the humans put up. These birds come and nest under the deck year after year. There's actually a couple different types of birds that do this. Uh, there's some morning doves that have nested underneath of the deck before, uh, had some little finches and, and chickadees up under there. And so you can see that there's a couple nests under there. You can see that there's some perching on the wire and then there's the, the shelves off to the side there. Uh, I had been intending to move those, but the birds seem to like perching on them, so I, I've left them for the moment. Uh, but you can see how they've really developed a nice harmony with the structure that is uh, in place. And uh, this house has been here now for about 30 years, but at the same time, uh, the birds have, have really over that time adapted to it nicely and uh, it's not an impediment to them anymore but rather is just part of how they live. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to just watch and listen here for a minute and see how the bird moves around and listen to the different bird calls that you hear in the background. Enjoy. And as our little friend heads back into the nest here, we're going to move along and look at some specific bird facts. Here's a fun fact. The most common bird in the world is the chicken. There are more chickens on earth than people. I guess that's good for those of us that like to eat chicken and eggs. We looked at the hummingbird earlier, but they have a really unique skill and that's that they can hover. Other birds can't do that. Also, hummingbirds can fly backwards. An important idea to understand about some birds is migration and the fact that they move from place to place depending on the season. Not all birds do this, but some do. We see that mostly around here with geese. However, there's another bird, the Arctic Tern, that migrates a lot further. It goes all the way from the North Pole to the South Pole every year. Some birds have been found to be very smart, like the African gray parrot. It's thought to be the smartest of all birds and can learn to say over 900 words. Now for a human, that's not very much, but for a bird, that's really good. Some birds are really helpful to have around. Owls are great pest control. A single barn owl will eat over a thousand mice every year. They hunt at night and use their big eyes and sharp talons to help them find and catch the mice. Not all birds can fly, but they have other adaptations that help them get around quickly. Penguins are one of these birds. They use their flippers for swimming and steering themselves under the water. Also remember, there are no penguins at the North Pole. They always live at the South Pole near South America and Antarctica. Birds that can fly can get going really quickly though, like this falcon that can fly up to 200 miles per hour. 
Earlier I mentioned the owl's good eyesight, and they have great sight at night, but eagles are known for their excellent eyesight all throughout the day. They can see fish swimming 100 feet below them, and their eyesight is known to be four times as good as ours. That's pretty amazing, and that means that when we see them flying overhead, they definitely see us too. Here's a look at some geese that I had mentioned earlier. Geese can fly and swim on top of the water. One of the reasons that they like to be on the water is that they can submerge their heads and eat aquatic grasses. They also eat grass and insects on solid land. Speaking of insects... Insects. Let's, Let's get, get some, some facts. facts. Insects belong to the largest group of animals in the entire world, and all share similar traits, most of which you see on the diagram in front of you. Now, not all insects have wings, but the other body structures are very important for classifying what an insect is. The main pieces of an insect's body are the head, thorax, and abdomen. These three parts help to define an insect versus something like a spider, which is an arachnid, which has a head and thorax combined together and a separate abdomen. On the head, you can see that there are antenna, mandibles, and eyes. The eyes help them see just like us. The mandible is like their mouth and typically they can bite. And then the antennas help them to feel around. On the thorax, you'll see that there are four wings and hind wings, four not being the number, but meaning front. And then at the back, you can see the label for the six jointed legs. Now the legs are not actually at the back of the insect, they are connected in the middle there, but they have six legs and that's very important as well. That helps to define what an insect is, if it has six legs, as opposed to say eight, like an arachnid. Taking a look at different insects, we'll start with the wasp that I showed you earlier. This is clearly an insect. You can see the three body parts there. You can see the wings coming off the back, and then you can see the six legs. The front legs are a little bit smaller than the back two, but all six are there. Something else you want to keep an eye on are those big mandibles at the front there. Not only can this guy give you a pretty good sting, but he can also give you a painful bite. They're good pollinators though, so we don't always want to have to kill them. Sometimes while going about their daily business, insects are accidentally destructive to our structures. And that's what you have here. Carpenter bees have bored through this piece of deck railing, and this will need to be replaced in order for it to be effective in the future. Sometimes insects might just seem dirty and annoying like a housefly, but they are actually part of the ecosystem and provide part of the food chain for things like birds, lizards, and amphibians. So it's not entirely bad that they stick around. Next up, we're going to take a look at a, another commonly seen group of insects, and those are moths and butterflies. Now, despite looking similar and a lot of people thinking that they're actually the same thing, they are very different animals. Now, they both have the main body parts of an insect, a head, thorax, and abdomen. They both have wings, and they both have long tongues called proboscis that uncoil for feeding. Uh, they, they drink out of flowers. In, in similar ways. However, there are important differences between them as well. Moths are mostly nocturnal, which means that they're active at night, whereas butterflies are diurnal, which means they are mostly active during the day. Bodies of the butterfly tend to be longer and skinnier, whereas moths tend to be a, a little bit more thick through the body and uh, sometimes have the appearance of, of a hairy body instead of the smoother body that one typically sees on a butterfly. Most butterflies will rest with their wings folded together above their bodies. Moths, on the other hand, spread their wings out to the sides, as you can see in the picture here. Uh, most butterflies are also very colorful, but many moths are not very bright, and that has to do with the fact that they want to blend in at night and not be eaten by nighttime predators, so they don't want to stand out very much. That's an important adaptation for them. Both moths and butterflies go through a complete metamorphosis, which means that they go from an egg to a larva to a pupa to an adult. A butterfly forms in a chrysalis, whereas a moth forms in a cocoon. A chrysalis tends to look uh, almost hard and sometimes plasticky on the outside, whereas the cocoon looks like it's made out of fabric. 
these are very important differences when looking to see what type of container you found, whether it's a chrysalis that's going to spawn a butterfly, or if it is a cocoon that's going to spawn a moth. So despite looking very similar and having very similar features, they're actually very different animals that develop a little bit differently and are active at different parts of the day. Well, that wraps up pollinators, birds, and insects. Let's head back to the garden for our weekly plant updates. Here we are at a plant that we haven't looked at since the very beginning of the start of these videos, and that is the crepe myrtle that's growing at the corner of my driveway and sidewalk. This crepe myrtle is really starting to put out leaves now. They are going to be big and vibrant here soon, and they are coming in all along all the branches and little stems that you see here. And so we'll be watching the development of these, but we've looked at the little crepe myrtles. They had the leaves coming in earlier, but this big guy is now starting to put out leaves too. So that'll be something more for us to watch in the coming weeks. Here's the smaller crepe myrtle that we've been watching over the last couple weeks put out leaves. You can see we have even more progression from last time, and this one is definitely way ahead of the larger one that we just looked at, but pretty soon they will be about equal in terms of leaf size and color. Another exciting update here, I have my elephant ear coming back. Now this one's up near the house. I don't dig it up, and the warmth of the house keeps it nice over the winter, keeps the bulb uh, alive under the ground there and you can see that it is starting to come out in force these are going to grow up really quickly and over the next couple weeks you're going to get to see just how big they start to get these leaves get really really big i think that you'll be pretty impressed and uh, stay tuned in the coming weeks to see the development on those we've got a really fun update here between the bananas and the lemon fluff going all the way back to the very, very first uh, video that, that I had put out, I had talked about my cold hardy hibiscus and how they would eventually come up, not out of the woody stalks that I had cut off, but then uh, just around the base of the plant. And as you can see here, we have branches starting to come up and these will grow pretty quickly now and we'll get to see a lot of progress here over the next few weeks and then some really really big pretty flowers that the pollinators will absolutely love. The tiny dinos continue to grow rapidly. They're getting really big as you can see compared to my hand here and they're starting to form some uh, bloom clusters here in the center so they are getting ready to put out flowers here in just a couple weeks. Checking in on the stone crop, everything's looking good here. It's firmly established at this point and growing nicely. Got a bit of a good news, bad news situation here with the banana. The leaves are still coming out really nicely. The problem is we had a really windy couple days and it tore up the leaf coming out of the top. So it didn't get burned this time by a freeze or a heavy frost. Instead, it was uh, whipped around by the wind a bit and ripped up. Uh, it will keep growing out quickly though. You can already see that we have the beginnings of, uh, of the rest of the leaf pushing out here with uh, another leaf right in the middle of that coming right behind it. It will grow in very, very quickly now that we're going to have some consistently warm weather heading our way. Now this is an update that I'm really excited about. What was my standalone banana here now actually has a couple of little banana shoots coming up out of the ground. So at this point, this is going to be at least a cluster of three banana trees by the end of the season. Here you can see that the basil plants are doing nicely in the tray on the deck and are almost ready to go ahead and plant for the rest of the season. And here's Ella standing guard over the palms that we transplanted before. Before we wrap up, I did want to let you know that I have gone ahead and put the petunias into the ground for the season. They were doing well in the cups and it was warm enough outside to go ahead and get them in the ground. So here's a little sped up version of me putting a couple of them into the garden where hopefully they will continue to spread for the rest of the season. Here I was noticing they're a little root bound, as you can see, but now that they're into the ground, those roots should spread out quickly and help to establish the flowers so that they're nice and strong across the rest of the season.
And there you have it, with the mulch back in place around the base of the flower, they are good to go. Thanks for joining me again on this old garden. Join me next time when we'll be talking about reptiles and amphibians and checking in again on our plants. Say goodbye, Ella.